Okay, it says we should be streaming live. So, um, I'll wait a second and make sure we have some confirmation and then I'll get started. Oh, okay, all right. It looks like we're good. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name's Jen Holden. I'm a real estate agent with Coldwell Banker in Annapolis Plaza. And this is the third in our series of webinars for sellers um, called Ready, Set, Sell. And this week we're gonna talk about pricing your home and um, why it even matters to be accurate in this, in this kind of a market. Um, and I'd like to also introduce Mike Archer, um, a longtime uh, member of our squad who we rely on heavily. He's with First Home Mortgage. And um, it's going to give us a little bit of insight into what he's seeing as far as um, buyer and seller activity and appraisals in this sort of current micro market that has really taken off in the past couple of months. Um, so to get started, um, the big question right now is why is accurate pricing important? Um, in this particular market, everybody feels like, you know, houses are selling before they even hit the market. You know, I don't know what you're hearing, Mike, around town, but we hear all the time, you know, hey, uh, this person always told me if I wanted to move, they'd buy my house and, you know, and, and now they're ready. And, and so things are just going super fast. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's, and sometimes it is about that convenience. Sometimes it is about getting the highest price for you. Sometimes it's about special terms that you need. If you're building a home and you need, you know, to sell in a particular time frame or be able to get a rent back or other things. So there's a lot that goes into setting your price. Um, and it really, it's going to depend on your goals. Um, you know, the other reason that to us, um, we feel it's very important to price accurately is, you know, we have three legs that we stand on when we list your house. It has to be able to be shown <laughs> easily. Um, it has to be marketed well and give you great exposure, um, but it also has to be the right price. And there's no amount of marketing that we can do, no amount of exposure we can get you that will make up for the house not being priced correctly. And even in this market, over the past 30 days, we're still not seeing a list to sale ratio that's going over 100%. So I know we're seeing a lot of things that are being um, bid up. A lot of buyers are in multiple offer situations where houses are selling for over asking, but that is still not the case across the board. So you don't want to be that house in your neighborhood where everything sells in five days and you're still sitting out there 60 days later. Uh, you know, so buyers know what, what things are selling for. Um, and the last piece of this is that, um, you know, when we sell your home, we have to sell it twice. We have to sell it to a buyer or one of 10 buyers who makes an offer. Um, but then we also have to sell it to an appraiser. So, you know, um, the nature of the appraisal is that it's a backward looking scenario, but I don't know, Mike, if you can talk a little bit about what's going into that in this market and how this sort of pushing up of prices in the in the short term is affecting you know what you're seeing come in so over the last say two months one to two months we've seen more and more of what you're describing where there's an escalation of the sales price either to the list price or in some cases even higher and that puts the appraiser in a predicament because the appraiser will often call me the lender and say Mike, reach out to your realtors and find out what they based this sales price on because I'm not seeing anything that supports this high of a price. And so it is a, a system that's limited. When we do appraisals, we're doing it based on a sales comparison approach, which means we're looking at what has sold exactly like the subject property. And if a house has sold that's very much like it, how do we now justify this one's 10 grand more in value? So we're kind of butting our heads up on that. And it is a regular occurrence now because of five or six buyers competing on the house. Mm -hmm. There's often an escalation clause and that escalation clause keeps, keeps accelerating or pushing the sales price up to a value that's maybe not supported by the appraiser, but it does get the buyer into the contract, which can be a strategy. 
Right, and and we have seen that happen as well, where um, the buyer will do that in order to get into the property. And then the appraisal, the important part if you're selling your house is to realize the appraisal can knock you back down a little bit um, if, you know, if we can't support that value. Um, you know, so just kind of to look at what, what we would consider in setting your price um, is absolutely the market conditions, right? How many houses are for sale right now around you? What's the buyer demand, which we know is generally pretty high. Um, interest rates and the avail availability of financing is really pushing a lot of demand as well. Um, but we do have to look at what's recently sold and you know try to determine if this demand that we're seeing at this exact instant is gonna continue. Um, you know, we'll go through and we'll look at the condition of your actual house. Um, you know, is there anything about the floor plan or the architectural style um, or updates that you've made that's going to demand a higher price or maybe an adjustment so that you don't have to do that work? Um, and then, you know, a, a lot of times I like to either take my clients on a tour of the competition or at the very least be well aware of what's the active competition doesn't matter as much just like the appraisal in setting the price compared to what has sold, but you do need to be aware of what else is out there. Um, just as important as what we look at is what we don't look at. So um, uh, I have family members who wish that this was true, but what I paid for my house plus what I've spent on it does not equal what I can sell it for. Um, nor does the amount of money I need to get out of my house when I sell it. Um, and fortunately for me, neither does my neighbor's opinion or my mom and dad's opinion. So we really try to keep it to things that we can measure um, because that's exactly what we're going to be faced with, um, you know, with, with an appraisal. Um, you know, and I don't know, um, Mike, maybe you can comment, but I think most of what we're seeing with buyers making offers is primarily those houses that are brand new to the market. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of buyers chasing things that are stagnant and have been sitting. It's much more the feeding frenzy on the new active listings. And you brought up a really good point, Jen, dep earlier, depending on where you're buying, these homes that are hitting the market are already sold. So it does come down to knowing your realtor and that realtor knowing the market because as you said, neighbors selling the neighbors is part of it, but you got to know about them before they're going to hit the market to have a real fair chance. And it's, you know, it's really calling on um, actual sales skills on the part of buyer agents now to do that, uh, that networking and lay that groundwork and working connections and talking to neighbors um, and really going all out to find a house for um, for a buyer. And in fact, we have something awesome within Coldwell Banker called Exclusive Look where we can post within our brokerage and say, hey, I have a buyer looking for this. And it may be that if the seller's goals are price, but also convenience and not having to go on the market that sometimes you can make a match before you're even listed. Um, but, you know, to your point um, about the stagnant homes, you know, the analogy that um, real estate agents are taught from the beginning of time is about the loaf of bread. You know, you don't want your listing to go stale like a loaf of bread after, let's call it 14 to 30 days. Um, you're really going to be in a position where people are going to want to know why hasn't this house sold, you know, and the longer things go on and buyers have already looked at what's on the market. That's why there's the feeding frenzy on the new listing. So by keeping something to an aggressive but fair price, we're really going to give you the best opportunity to sell it in the shortest period of time. Um, and the other thing that that really factors into that, uh, that I love that Cole Banker puts out is called a 30, 60, 90 day report. And what that tells you is about across time, about half of the listings for sale in any market will sell in the first 30 days. Might be more, but let's call it half. And those houses are going to come the closest to the asking price. If it sits longer than 30 days, it might sell in about, if it sells in about two months, you probably get about 95% of your price. And if it sits longer than that, the average actually turns into seven months um, and you end up with about 90% of your asking price. So you may want to push the envelope way beyond what you think you can do, but you're going to end up, you know, wishing that you would have been uh, a little more fair from the start. Um, so one other thing I wanted to go over super quickly, um, you know, is obviously, 
um, a lot of sellers are saying to us right now, hey, does it even matter where I price my house? Because in this environment, as soon as it's listed, I'll find a buyer for it. Um, and we talked about, you know, that we don't want to sit on the market. We also talked about that we need the house to appraise. But the last thing I wanted to get Mike's opinion on um, was really to talk about selling your current home in order to buy your new home. And that's called being a contingent buyer. Um, and that process, even today, represents a level of risk that most home sellers do not want to take on. So if I'm selling my house to Mike and Mike says, that's fine, but now I have to add a domino in the chain and I have to sell my house to buy your house and there's someone else who wants to buy my house that doesn't have that contingency, that other person is gonna beat Mike all the time. Um, and I don't know if you can comment a little bit on what you're seeing that buyers have to do in order to overcome that problem. So now probably more than ever in, the, in my career, buyers are having to be creative to find ways to be non-contingent. If you are contingent, I don't believe you have a chance of winning a contract in this current market in most of the counties in Maryland because of how competitive it is. The seller's in a very strong position. They're getting five or six offers and they're able to really dig in and look at those offers and take the best one. So the first thing that's gonna exclude you from, from winning that offer would be a contingent sale, a house you have to sell and money you need to get out of it to buy the next one. So digging in there and being creative and trying to find money is what I'm doing now. Helping people understand they are probably more liquid than they realize and if we can tap into that money and help bridge the gap as we call it, bridge the gap meaning you need the money from your house to buy the next one. And right. that, you know, there's a bunch of different ways I'm helping people find that money. Um, but then again, as you said, it is a risk that you have to carry both and the borrower has to qualify for both, which can also be a challenge. So my answer to that is sometimes we need a co-signer to help bridge the gap. Mom, dad, grandma, granddad help qualify for the purchase before the house sells. And then once it sells, we can carry the money forward to go a little further on that. When you carry that money forward after you've already bought the house, Normally, you'd have to refinance to get a benefit of a lower payment on the house mm -hmm. you just bought. But we offer what's called a recast, which by definition is a reamortization of the remaining loan balance over the remaining term. Okay. So let's say, let's say you buy a $500,000 house. You only have the ability to put your 5% down because your money's tied up in your other house. Then when it sells, you'll have like 100 or 80 to carry forward. Well, carrying forward, normally when you put that big payment down on your new loan, doesn't change your payment because your payment was predetermined okay. and preset. So the recast allows you to add that 80 grand as down payment and then we'll recalculate and drop your monthly payment. Got it. So we've got a lot of tools for the borrowers to make this possible. And it's definitely a conversation that you need to have but even before you list your house mm -hmm. to understand how to make this all work and to know that if you're lucky enough to find a seller that might wait for your house to sell, great but we need to have the backup option of how are we going to do it if we can. Mm -hmm. And how long do you have to do the recast? We can do the recast anytime. And in most cases, as often as you like, it's okay. normally about a $200 fee. You drop your big down payment on it, recast the loan, and you have a new lower payment. Say five years from now, you get a nice bonus and you want to put that bonus in, you mm -hmm. could do another recast. Okay. And you know, Jen, to go back on another point you made, in my neighborhood, which I see and know very well, it's very competitive and everybody buys homes very quickly, but there's two or three that are sitting on the market and they've been sitting on the market. It's not because they're not a nice house. It's because they came in priced too high. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, they priced it as if they wanted to make money back they lost or something. It just wasn't appropriate mm -hmm. price. Great house. People are looking right past it. Well, and you know, what else is interesting um, is when you're getting ready to sell, sell your home, please be aware that what you paid for it and when you bought it is public information, um, not to mention how many times you've tried to sell it before and what you started out at. 
So in a lot of cases, buyers will ask me, why is this house still sitting here? And most of the time we can look back and see, hey, wow, you know, their starting price was so different from where they are now that those buyers who had seen everything on the market and were ready to roll, um, passed it over and they never came back. So you sort of get one shot to capture buyer eyeballs and it has to be that perfect combination of, you know, we can get you gorgeous photography and videography and make you look fantastic online. But if we can't combine that with an accurate price, people will pass you over even now. Um, and, and it is a challenge, um, you know, and, and I think to your point, the other thing that I'm seeing people have to do is say, listen, I need to sell my current house to buy my dream house. I know I can't get it if I'm contingent, so I'm going to go non-contingent and then I'm gonna paddle furiously to sell it without the contingency. So now you've got the stress of, I might be owning two homes. I might not be able to do the purchase. You know, there's, there's a lot that goes into that consideration of which, you know, which problem do you want to have? <laughs> um, but you know, all, all the more reason that if your purchase of your dream home depends on you being able to sell your current home quickly, you know, really focus on paying attention to the market and what is sold, where the house is likely to appraise and what the buyer demand is um, in order to set that accurately. So, uh, you know, buyers are blowing it out of the water, but it doesn't take away your responsibility to, to do your homework. Um, and, and, you know, that's what we're here to help you with. Um, so, you know, I, I think the only other question I have for you, um, as regards to this topic, Mike, is are you seeing appraisals not come in at all? Uh, yes, not very commonly, honestly. Uh, some of the times when we get a low appraisal, I lean back on the realtors because the realtors can give us data that support the sales price. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're often successful in that where I see, um, a low appraisal coming is when the house is listed at X and sales price ends up being X plus 10,000 and that 10,000 is seller concession. Mm -hmm. So if you're raising the sales price just so you can give the seller money, that's a red flag to the appraiser. They see it as clear as I do. And right. then they're challenged with finding a house that sold just like it for 10 grand more. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, that's the challenge, Jen, is when you're going up over the sales price or the comps, and it, it really just shows through a seller concession being the only reason the price was escalated. Yep. And that's a whole separate discussion is to talk about what to do if you are using a program or in a position where um, you'd like to have the seller closing cost contribution, um, because we're also finding really that to be competitive, buyers are, are having to reduce or eliminate. <laughs> I see you shaking your head or completely eliminate <laughs> uh, that as an option. So, um, you know, uh, definitely strategies for helping the buyers win is a topic for another day, but um, I really appreciate your contributions and your insights um, from the mortgage lending world. So thank you, Mike Archer of First Home. And um, if you guys have any questions at all about the current value of your house or where we would price it if you were trying to sell it today, definitely give me a call. Um, and I'm going to make a quick pitch here that if you are even thinking of selling, please let me know if we can make a match. We have buyers who have written, Mike and I actually were so excited because one of our buyers literally wrote 11 offers before she won a deal. Mike went above and beyond to get her condo VA approved so that she could go forward with that. But we have buyers who really are ready to go pre-qualified, um, you know, and have that ability to be non-contingent, no seller closing help, and would love to know about your house and you're getting ready to sell it. So um, that's the end of my day. Thank you, Mike, and um, take care, guys, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.